is amazing in 2015, I'm fighting Robert E. Lee. This is, oh, it's almost hilarious. Those statues that should have been erected, the South lost. Let's take down these statutes and put them in a place of proper remembrance, not reverence. Four monuments to the Confederacy are set to come down in New Orleans. The vote is considered one of the most sweeping moves by a U.S. city to cut ties with Confederate history. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Backlash over a plan to remove these prominent monuments has led to death threats, intimidation, and even the intentional torching of a contractor's Lamborghini. We're live out here at the Jeff Davis Monument. It is extremely chaotic right now. We cannot have reconciliation without truth. Okay. Here we go. This, for me, is the closest we can get to the actual Confederacy. Somebody is going to abuse the institution. People don't always take care of their objects well. Right. Including when that object is a person. Including when it's a person. Yeah. We have intentionally misrepresented this history to our own citizens on purpose. These people who are really bigoted, I bet we could just change their minds. <laughs> Why, why do you think that? I don't know, because may, I have Why do you hold that hope out, that illusion? These stories are coming out. So I think we're in a different portal of time that these things are not going to be swept under the rug any longer. Hello and good evening. What a powerful film we just experienced together. Uh, my name is Thomas Allen Harris, and I will be serving as a moderator for our panel tonight. This event is part of a screening series uh, this semester associated with my course titled Family Narratives, Cultural Shifts, where we focus on personal films by documentarians, artists, activists, and agents of change who are united in their use of the nonfiction format to speak truth to power. The series is generously supported by the Schwartzman Center, African American Studies, Film and Media Studies, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Center for Race, Ingenuity and Transmedia Migration, Kuitner Fellowship, School of Art, Yale College Arts, and the Yale Film Archive. At Yale, I am a senior lecturer in African American Studies and Film and Media Studies. In addition to being, to being an educator, I am also a filmmaker and an artist working across film, video, photography, and performance through a socially engaged practice centered on community storytelling and archives. Most recently, I have hosted and produced the PBS series, Family Pictures USA, which takes a radical look at neighborhoods and cities in the United States through the lens of family photographs, collaborative performances, and personal testimonies sourced from their communities. And in 2021, I launched the Family Pictures Institute for Inclusive Storytelling. I'd like to share a short clip with you that introduces this work. If this image were in a museum, no one would doubt its importance to our shared history. But history isn't just the artifacts in institutions. It's also the precious objects we hold in our hands and hearts. The ordinary family photos that people create every day. This is Family Pictures. Family Pictures. Family Pictures USA action. I'm Thomas Allen Harris, filmmaker, photographer, and host of Family Pictures USA. We're traveling the country inviting everyone to share their family photos, revealing a new history of our community, our country, and ourselves. Once you see America through family pictures, you'll never see this country the same way again. As you can see, I've long been engaged in questions of community storytelling, interrogating how we tell complex, sometimes deeply, deeply fraught American stories in public. I'm so pleased to host and moderate a conversation with CJ Hunt, filmmaker CJ Hunt, Professor David Blight, and artist and educator Allison Mintu, who, will all be do who are all doing this very important work in distinct ways. CJ Hunt, is the director of The Neutral Ground. He is a comedy writer and director living in New York City. 
In addition to his documentary work, he is, a, he is currently a field producer for The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. CJ has been a staff writer for A&E's Black and White, a cast member for on MTV's Vidiots, and a field producer for BET's The Rundown and Robin Thede. A graduate from Brown University in Africana Studies, CJ is endlessly fascinated by race and comedy's ability to say what we can't. Welcome, CJ. David W. Blight is a Ster is Sterling Professor of History and Director of the Gilman Lair Center for the Study of R Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. He is an award-winning author and editor of a dozen books, including Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, American Oracle, The Civil War in the Civil Rights Era, Race and Reunion, The Civil War in American Memory, and annotated editions of Douglas's first two autobiographies. He writes frequently for the popular press, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many other journals. Allison Minto is a Connecticut-based artist and educator. She holds an MFA in photography from Yale School of Art, where she received the John Ferguson Ware Award and a BA in journalism from SUNY Buffalo State College. Allison's practice is rooted in community, collaboration, and field research. Her photography takes on themes around African-American archives, family, history, memory, preservation, and maintenance. She has a 2021-22 Happy and Bob Doran Connecticut artist and resident and a 2021-22 Docs, DocX Lab Fellow at Duke University and a member of Diversity Photo. And Allison is also my former student as well as that of <laughs> Professor David Blight. Uh, welcome all. Thank you. Thanks. So um, uh, uh, for the CJ Hunt, thank you so much for being here um, with us at Yale virtually. Um, in many ways, the neutral ground is a family story. You know, considering the nation as a family, James Baldwin um, famously called, uh, to paraphrase it, no, or actually to quote, no matter who says what, in fact, Negroes and whites in this country are, are related to each other. Half black families in the South are related, you know, to the judges and lawyers and white families of the South. They are cousins, kissing cousins at that. And I was interested in how important it was to center your connection with your family and your, 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 um, your roots uh, in the story and telling the story, setting it up and also circling back. Um, did you begin the, the film in this way or at what point did you, um, did you include this, this family narrative? And could you just tell us a little bit about how the film evolved since you began? Sure, thanks. It's, it's uh, uh, this is, this is a, a heck of a panel and I, I'm very honored to be with you all. Um, can I say heck? Uh, I, this film, this became a film when, when we decided to put my dad in it. So the beginning of this film is very reflective of what the project was in those first days, right? It's very much me being a comedian living in New Orleans, aspiring to someday work on a show like The Daily Show. Uh, you know, Late Night was really at its height at the time. Full Frontal with Samantha B was out. Folks like Roy Wood Jr. and Jessica Williams were just really killing it in field pieces about race. So at the time, my whole, I didn't want to be a documentarian. I wasn't watching a lot of documentaries. My mindset was how do I become a, a comedian uh, who's able to tackle social topics? So my whole visual language was from late night. So of course you see all that like big microphone, putting a microphone in people's faces. Well, what, it wouldn't be okay if it's just the horse, uh, just the horse. Look at these jokes on the iPad. And thank God the film isn't that for 82 minutes. You know, we, we showed that footage to a lot of black filmmakers who are, who are in my community with, you know, I'm part of this community called Firelight Media and um, that, that, you know, Stanley Nelson and um, uh, started this uh, and a, a lot of, a lot of um, black filmmakers who are my friends would watch this and their feedback would be like, this is funny, but for what? Like, is, is, this, just, uh, is this just a sketch? Like, what is this for? And, you know, I would explain, oh, well, in my house, this is just, 
I'm obsessed with race because my dad, you know, used to give me lynching books, you know, when I was a kid and Loyola Limbaugh and uh, Marsha Smith and um, Chloe Walters Wallace. Those are all filmmakers who were like, yo, you need to dig in there and figure out where that obsession comes from. And that was my dad. So like that turning the mirror back on myself wasn't something I thought filmmaking had to do. And that is the moment that it became actually something more than just a sketch. And uh, how did it evolve over the course of the, um, uh, since, you know, since that time when you, when you invited your father to be a part of the film? Just, just briefly, how did, did it, how did it change? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm Baldwin's a big, Baldwin's a big fan of saying that, you know, in order to tell the truth about the country, you have to tell the truth about yourself. And I, I didn't think satire required that. I was very upset that I had to do that. <laughs> you know, my, my producer Darcy was like, hey, you have to talk about yourself. And I'm like, you know, the, the white men who make documentaries and put microphones in people's faces, they're not always having to talk about themselves. They can just talk about an issue. They, we, they, we trust their eyes out in the field. So I was really resistant to the idea that I even had to go talk to my dad. But once that opened, there's sort of like a raw heart to who am I and what are the questions I'm pursuing and what does that have to do with being able to see yourself in history as a Black person that, that actually opened up a lot of things for us. So I think the challenge for a long time was like, okay, how do we meld these sit-down interviews with these historians plus this verite filmmaking that I'm not even on camera for, plus, you know, sort of my comedic ideas. And it took us a while to find that language. But once we did, it, the, the main challenge was figuring out when to end. You know, we thought that the film was going to be done in, in the summer of 2017. That is when Charlottesville happened. We thought the film, we, we were done with the film in the summer of 20, in the spring of 2020. That is when George Floyd was lynched. So it was, the biggest challenge is, is like how to, use humor for the right reasons and for the and to unlock the right emotion in the audience but then also dear god like give us a break white supremacy we're trying to end the film and and how how fat to make the film you know do we extend to include charlottesville do we extend to include the capital riot do we extend to include kyle rittenhouse you know and so so figuring out when to end that was the biggest challenge thank you um uh, 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 David Blight, um, the idea of when to end the story and how a story continues past its quote unquote ending moment, um, perhaps is something that you're concerned with, with Yale and slavery. The, um, if you could talk a little bit about the, the uh, Yale and slavery in, uh, 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 symposium and study, um, and uh, the conference that was recently, that recently happened, uh, the big conference that recently happened at Yale last uh, week was, was really powerful. I mean, I learned so much about New Haven. I, you know, I learned a lot about what was going on at other institutions, including uh, as well as Yale. Um, could you talk a little bit about both Yale and slavery and also how you see this film in dialogue with that, that, that conference and this, this ongoing study? Uh, yes, and thank you, Thomas, and thanks to the Schwarzman Center staff for putting this on and CJ for making this film. I have to say, first of all, CJ, I howled out loud that little throwaway line about Alexander H. Stevens needing. <laughs> I'm sorry, it may, it may be know, a weird sense of humor. It's but, a it's a giant hole in your scholarship, David. Why haven't you talked I mean, about? I know. Alexander Stevens' lip care regimen. You know, the next, academy wasn't focused on it. I needed to bring it up. Got it. The next time I talk about the cornerstone speech, I'm going to show his face and that needs yes. to drink. You know, when the film started, I thought this is really going to be a Michael Moore esque comedy tragedy, you know, all mixed in one with you and your dad at the center. <laughs> you know? oh, but the comedy goes away, as you well know. Well, but to the Yale and Slavery Project, thanks for that question. I'll be quick with this. It's, it's, a, it's a huge project. Yale is a bit late to this. Uh, any number of other universities have done or are in the middle of doing studies of their own history with slavery and its aftermath. It's many afterlives. Um, 
This was uh, launched and sponsored by the president of Yale, Peter Salovey, more than a year ago. He asked me to chair it for my sins. And we've created a, a, a fairly large a coalition of a working group, faculty, three librarians who are crucial to this, uh, two really key community people who are serving intimately on this project, and then a whole handful, large handful of um, student research assistants. This is the way you do these things. We've got 320 years of Yale to try to cover. And my staff at the Gilder Lehrman Center is also very closely involved in this, especially Michelle Zacks. Uh, we found all kinds of things, which we revealed already at last week's conference here. We now know that at least five, maybe six of the 20 some odd laborers who built Connecticut Hall, which is the oldest and uh, if not the most famous building at Yale, the oldest brick building in Connecticut, at least five or six of those laborers were slaves. We know how many days they worked on that building. We know that some five or six out of the first 10 presidents of, or rectors or presidents of Yale were themselves slave owners. Often they, own, they owned only one or two, which was common normative in colonial 18th century Connecticut. Uh, I could go on and on about that 18th century origin story, uh, but I think especially pertinent for our discussion of CJ's film here is that we have dug deeply into Yale's War Memorial, which went up in 1915, right during this period of the building of Confederate monuments, of the heightened triumph of the lost cause ideology across the country, not just in the South, as the film shows, but also in the North. The Yale War Memorial, which is located in one of the most prominent places on the Yale campus, possibly the most trafficked space, right inside now the Schwarzman Center, it used to be called Woolsey Hall, and I guess it's still called Woolsey Hall. But anyway, that War Memorial was dedicated in 1915. It is uh, several years in its inception, uh, it's chairs of the committee that created that, that memorial were one surviving Confederate officer who was a Yale and one surviving Yale uh, Northerner who was a Union officer and a Yale. Um, it was dedicated from its inception to national reconciliation. It was to be a monument to reunion. It was to be a monument explicitly in the language of its creation of a memorial to those who fought, I, I quote, on both sides in the Civil War to express the hearty acquiescence of both sides in the final result and the earnest wish that the union which now unites the land may be perpetual. Now this kind of reconciliation, as I wrote about 20 years ago in a book called Race and Reunion was all over the, the culture, it was everywhere. So it's not that surprising that Yale would do this, but Yale did this in part as a way of attracting Southern boys back to Yale. A long and concerted effort, uh, beginning really back in the 1890s, uh, had been going on to recruit Southerners back to Yale, to make Yale a national university, et cetera. And one of the ways they were doing it was what they called John C. Calhoun scholarships. Now, later in the 30s, when Yale creates, famously now, uh, a, one of its residential colleges named for John C. Calhoun, it was sort of a no-brainer. They'd been honoring Calhoun for, you know, for two generations. They've been naming scholarships for him. They've been honoring him over and over and over. Um, so part of our study, and there are many other elements to it, is going to show the depth of that war memorial in this very story this film developed of the ways in which the, the ideology of the Confederate lost cause sunk so deeply into the national culture. And it portrays this idea of national reunion as the nation's triumph. But of course, we know now that that triumph means the great cost of the liberties, the rights, the aspirations, the future of African-Americans now two and three generations out of slavery. Uh, 
because of this reconciliation. Now, there were black students at Yale around the turn of the 20th century, early 20th century, handfuls, not that many. But our working group on Yale and slavery recently, among the many public events we've done, we sponsored an event uh, really planned by Charles Warner, one of our New Haven community members of our group. We sponsored a remarkable event with the descendants of four Yale graduates, African-American Yale graduates from the 1890s and into the early 20th century, remembering their ancestors who actually went to Yale. So there's, there's, this, there's stories underneath the stories here in the story of race, racism, slavery, and abolition at Yale. And that's ultimately the purpose of this thing. And sometime in the coming year, uh, we will publish a book about all this, um, I hope. In the coming year, we will publish that book. We got to write it first, but you know how that goes. Anyway, I, I could go on about that, but I shouldn't because we got a lot more to talk about in relation to this film. But it's amazing how much this film is really all about that moment when yeah. Yale creates the story of itself. Yeah, and I think that one of the things we'd like to return to is how the film can be used um, in um, educational institutions, you know, and with some of what your plans and ideas are, you know, CJ, in terms of um, opening up dialogues around the, the, this, this, uh, this narrative that was created in the Lost Cause that we're now dealing with, you know, uh, over 100 years uh, later. Um, I'd like to bring Allison Minto. Um, uh, uh, to the conversation. Welcome, Allison. Hi. Um, so, you know, when you were taking a, a course with me, you, we, we were workshopping uh, some work that you did with um, around the activism that happened on campus um, mm -hmm. after a period of students um, protesting uh, the, uh, the name of the Calhoun College. Um, a, 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 a worker in Calhoun, uh, uh, busted out a, 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 a window and you did a lot of work with in that in that regard um, and his narrative and so I remember seeing videos and and so so um, I'd like you to come and, and just talk a little bit about that work and also how you see uh, uh, the neutral ground in dialogue with that with, with with these events and this work. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, that work, yeah, definitely made in your class. I remember that because it wasn't until I was having coffee with a friend and they, they had mentioned that 2016 incident at Calhoun, it was then called Calhoun College. Um, but for me at the time, I was, my first initial reaction was like, where is this piece? I'm um, like, where is it now? Because when I look at the dining hall, it's still empty. Um, and this is like end of 2018, beginning of 2019 that like I was making several images about that work. Um, and because most, most of my work in photography deals with the public and private space of how we view monuments, how cultural institutions set values versus how we set values in our home, you know, what are our monuments there? Um, and so to know that this dining hall was Calhoun's depiction of the South, and um, I made an image of, of that glass, that, that, that broken stained glass window, which depicts two African-Americans who are enslaved, but they're, they're happy slaves, right? Have the nice cotton over their head, you know, fully clothed, you know, really neat, right? But that's like not the truth, right? It's not really, our, you know, what we come to know of it. Um, and so I think, I mean, well, I was more interested in um, one hearing Corey's perspective on like what happened that moment between when he broke the glass and when the cops arrived. Cause I think uh, it's really interesting where like most black men don't get to share that point of their story as to what was said, you know? Um, and so I made like a video clip about that too, but the photograph, um, this, this fractured piece of glass, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about what it means to fracture and fall apart um, and how um, our stories are often, you know, acquired and collected. And like, there's this weird fetish happening with, with um, our stories. And so like this, 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 this broken glass pieces has like this, this uh, Frankenstein kind of approach to it. That is really like, that thought was like, you know, we don't, black stories, we don't get to, um, if we don't get a hold of our narrative, right? Uh, it gets re resurrected. You know, we don't get to die in a way we don't have sense of control as to what happens and how we could decide what happens to our stories. So, 
you know, looking at something like that, I kind of pull inward and think about the space that I'm living in and how I can um, think about what preservation means and how we can challenge that and take more agency in our narrative. So just to be clear, this image that we're looking at now yeah. is, is actually the window that was in Calhoun College that that you uh, that was broken, that you somehow gained access to. And then uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. Just like once again, like the, the privilege of access, one being a student. And now that I'm alumni, it's a whole different way of access. Right. The access is starkly different. Um, but even just trying to get there. Right. And, and, and going down the spiral uh, staircase in the basement locked away, there's this piece, right, um, that was shattered, but now it's being put back together. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is in like, uh, I guess, a holding center or a curatorial. I, I don't know what the room is. Right. But this room is not really open for the public like that. I mean, this has been on display from what I've heard. Um, before I came to Yale, but um, what happens now? Where does this go? You know, and, and thinking about a relationship, you know, even with Harvard's case, you know, the Paparenti photograph and Delilah, that image is, you know, still up for debate and um, that image still doesn't get to, to fully rest. Um, and so how do we take care of our, our rethink our images uh, and think about these spaces? So in thinking about CJ's film, and think about monuments and really who's making those decisions. How can we as black and brown people um, take more agency in that? Thank you. And um, if we could um, uh, stop sc uh, screen sharing. Um, yeah, so, um, I, so let's open the conversation up. Um, oh, I mean, this, you know, what are the stakes of this work today? You know, we, we have, um, as you know, C, CJ and I have actually had a lot of pu several public conversations and you mentioned, you know, 24, we know in the news, you know, 24 states have now made it illegal to teach certain, um, um, uh, teach black history basically in, um, or any history that threatens a certain uh, dominant narrative in schools. Um, and at the same time, you have uh, institutions such a, of higher education actually in, embracing um, these narratives which had been excluded prior. Um, so how do we begin to uh, move forward in terms of um, a kind of a, a public discussion. You know, uh, the, one of the things that was really striking for me in the in the in the in the film, CJ, was your embedding yourself into the um, into the uh, Civil War uh, uh, reconstruct uh, Civil War reenactments, and there was an embrace and tolerance, and up until the point of the story. You know anything which is threatening the story is, is you know is 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 taboo. And I thought I think about um, Elizabeth Alexander's uh, opening keynote at the Yale and Slavery um, uh, uh, conference, in which she um, you know said there's the the when she talked about willful ignorance, and um, and so the question is how to engage, I guess I could talk, I could phrase a question in this way. Have you taken the film back to the people <laughs> that you, that you had, that were participated in the making of the film? For instance, the, the uh, Taylor, uh, the, you know, several of the people in the, in the Civil War reenactments, as well as the folks who were also protesting the delay in uh, taking down the statues. What yeah. has, what has the film been doing in uh, in the world, you know, since it's been made? Yeah, Thomas Taylor and the other neo Confederates in the film they love the film. It's like I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no uh, the the uh, I wanted to watch it. Uh, I think good documentary practice would have one watch it with the subject of the film. In, case, in the uh, case of some of the folks who in this film are white supremacists, that wasn't a tenable idea. So I um, emailed the, the final cut to, to some of those folks. And the one that I heard back from 
uh, who, you know, I had obviously had the most time with was Thomas Taylor. And his response was, uh, to paraphrase it, that it's clear that my dad is really hateful and it's clear that he passed that hate on to me. That's his take on the film. <laughs> um, not a surprising take, uh, but one I think that it should be instructive. I love the scene in the film where he refuses to go to a slavery museum. You know, his, his exact words were, oh, there's so much bullshit there. Um, shout out to the uh, Whitney um, the slavery museum. We were just there the other day, you know, working with some of their staff, but the idea that, in, that an institution that tells the truth about slavery, um, you know, it is objected to uh, just, just as, as, as openly as bullshit. I like watching that scene in audiences, in predominantly white audiences. My favorite sort of guilty pleasure is watching that scene in predominantly white audiences and hearing the crash of their dream uh, of, of hearts and minds, right? Like that scene to me is RIP, a hearts and minds approach. The, the dominant idea that, that we have in this country about race is that what is missing is dialogue, right? What is missing is cross-cultural dialogue. Every time there is a racial massacre, people call not necessarily for the protection of sort of liberal whites, call not necessarily for protection of communities of color and laws. They call for cross-cultural dialogue. And, you know, I, I want that scene to really send home to folks that dialogue is important, but dialogue is not the meal. Dialogue is the, the thing that should automatically come with the table, right? Like cross-racial dialogue is, is maybe the water, right? But if somebody brought you the check after you had some water and was like, did you enjoy the meal? You'd be like, we haven't even started. So for me, this notion that our job is to go out and find racists and convince them that racism is bad and, and really talk them out of their myth, to me, that is a waste of our time. Um, and we should be spending our time doing, doing better things for the protection of black and brown folks and for telling the truth. And I love the scene for that reason and for how hard it is to, to argue that we should be talking to racists instead of doing more productive things. But you do talk to um, a variety of different people in the film. I mean, you actually mm -hmm. do, that, do that work. And, um, and who's to say that there isn't a, some kind of impact, you know, in it, whether it's immediate or further down the line. And so, um, so I guess I, you know, to bring in uh, David here, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the grand stories uh, that, that make America, America. And, um, and the, you know, when reading um, the Frederick Douglass, you know, book and, and seeing how much it is, um, it, it's so um, resonant with, with today, you know, so many years after, you know, after the Civil War, after, you know, the abolitionist movement, where we're once again in movements around abolition. Um, how, I, I just want you to weigh in in terms of the, you know, the, this, this, this question of, is it worth it to <laughs> bring everyone along, you know, because as a historian, you know, yeah. part, part of what you're doing is, is, is educating, you know, people both yeah. in the academy, but also, at, uh, you know, in, in a much larger kind of um, a space. Well, ultimately, we do have to try to bring everybody along. That's been the goal of every social movement since social movements have begun. Uh, even if you just want to start with the abolitionists, uh, they, they only rarely succeeded, we must admit. What, there's a phrase you use in the film, CJ, I'm forgetting the exact context now, and it's the monster of the lost cause. It can't be killed just by taking down his monuments. Yeah. I thought that was particularly powerful if we think of this broadly. You begin your film here in 2015, 16, and we really have been living, a, I mean, all, all the police shootings and so forth were happening even before that, but we're really living a segment of history from the massacre in Charleston in, in June of 2015, right to now. I mean, none of us in my field, Civil War studies, Reconstruction, slavery, none of us before 2015 believed we would ever see Monument Avenue in Richmond literally come down. Honest to God. I mean, you could ask, if anybody historian says, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew that was coming, don't believe them. <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. 
these things were just so implanted in this mythology of the lost cause. And so we wrote books about it. We had conferences about it. We made films about it. You know, museum exhibition after museum exhibition to, to work against that grain, you know, in the hope that you convince some hearts and minds. That's the goal of what we do in teaching and writing and, and so on. Uh, that's the purpose of a university, for God's sake. Uh, but events change history. We've just been told that over and over and over again. Let's just say from the, the massacre at Amy, the Manual Amy Church to George Floyd, you know, and the events in between Charlottesville, and I couldn't believe you were actually there next to the next to the torch parades. I, it was a riveting piece of uh, that was unbelievable i can't believe you did that <laughs> but anyway uh it, but it made it so powerful to be right next to these guys uh but we've been taught now by events which actually was the phrase from douglas it, it, the chat the chapter title of my chapter on the secession movement and my biography of douglas is taught by events because his his immediate interpretation of that was that okay we've been fighting this fight over slavery politically for decades, but now our country will be taught by events, he said. And my God, were they. Who in, 19, who in 1858 would have stood up and said, slavery will be dead within five or six years? Hardly yeah. anyone. Now, most Confederate monuments are gonna to begin to come down. Five years ago, six years ago? You just you couldn't you couldn't have got an audience for such a ludicrous idea. But here we are now. I loved also your phrase at the it's right toward the end of the film. You know, but what timeline are we on? How do we know what timeline are we on? How can we tell? You know, historians are terrible at predicting. And yet we always get asked to do it. So we, <laughs> we usually try, even though we're terrible at it. Uh, so who knows what I do? What I do think, and your film shows this, and thanks for at least that short piece of Trump in there, is that Trumpism and all that we can associate with it, white supremacy being its core, and then many tentacles to, from that, hatred of government, uh, gangsterism as attractive government, and so on and so forth. But Trumpism is now embedded in an American political party. It really is embedded in an institution that will probably survive him. So I don't know what timeline we're on exactly, but that monster of the lost cause, it's not dead. And every time we think it is, like 2015 with Charleston um, or 2017 with Charlottesville and so on and so on, every time we think we've turned, well, Take the Obama election, my God, you know, that night in Grant Park in Chicago in uh, November 2008, the world changed. We all thought the world, and it did change, but then it didn't. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what we thought during Reconstruction, right? Yes, like, like, yes. If you go back, in fact, the most, the most optimistic speech of Frederick Douglass's life, he gives at the height of Reconstruction. It's in 1869. They've just passed the 15th Amendment. Yeah, it didn't have women in it, but my God, there's a voting rights amendment now. They'd passed the 14th, I mean, 14th Amendment passes in 66. It's just been ratified in 1868, which is equality before law, my God. You know, he gives this speech called the Composite Nation. And it's this dream of this multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-racial America, all living under equality before law and showing the world that it's possible. And at the middle of it, he makes it, he makes an aggressive case for Chinese immigration, <laughs> you know, which is just becoming a huge issue then. He never gives that speech again after about 1872, because it just doesn't fit the political context. Yeah. And so, you know, we're living one of those moments again. What timeline you're on, we don't, we never fully know what timeline we're on, except we have to learn from what we're experiencing in relation to the past. And I guess the a last point, uh, Thomas, about is it worth trying to reach these people? I agree with you, CJ. You're not, you know, that guy, Taylor, I mean, he was a smiling devil. And 
you know, and funny <laughs> as hell, but a smiling devil, and, you know, and he's still out there, right? And he's probably got sons. Uh, we know this uh, ideology is, is deeply rooted in our cultural life and uh, it will come back again. It will. We know that. We just have to be ready for it. And that's what's so hard. Um, you know, my, my answer is always learn more history, learn more history. Well, that's easy. I'm a historian. But that's not what most people do with their days. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's also that's also what I really love about David Byte's scholarship of like, it's very clear in all of your books that that white supremacy has always existed in equal proportion to expressions expressions of black freedom. Right. Yeah. So 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 they're this always idea, developing in tandem and in conflict. Yeah, they feed, they feed on each other. So as we tell ourselves this myth about, wow, Grant Park and Obama and we're turning a corner, the, the Reconstruction, they thought they were turning a corner as well, right? And we know that white supremacy is always around the corner. What, right. what, what was striking to me about the revolution of statues uh, after George Floyd was lynched mm -hmm. is that we are changing paradigm that we are no longer asking for permission, right? right. So much of my film is about the 511 days it takes for democracy to, to yeah. be meted out because we're asking a city for permission and moving through the official process, right? But after, after Charlottesville, just days yeah. after Charlottesville, yeah. you see monuments start coming, being pulled down in Durham and UNC and oh, yeah. you know the same night police stations are burning in 2020, you start seeing monuments just getting toppled. And to me, that goes back to, you know, the the brave act that Corey did in um, in breaking that window and what Allison has captured that I think the the main paradigm change that has happened is that ten years ago the debate about the window whether it should be there the debate about monuments in New Orleans what should happen with those the yeah. the, the process for that was going to gatekeepers and active white supremacists yeah, yeah, and pretending yeah. that we have to make a bargain, mm -hmm. right? right? How many Confederates, how many neo-Confederates did we bring on the news in 2016 and say, where do you think your symbols should go, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, mm -hmm. what is a happy medium? What would make you happy for, for, where, for where these things can go? And what we saw in 2020 is similarly to what we saw with the breaking of the window in Yale is that these things are cyclical when people move yeah. to move these monuments themselves, yeah. governments and institutions realize that white supremacy will not stand in space uncontested, right? That it will Act. always be, that it'll always be contested. And if the institution will not move them, if the yeah. institution will not take action, we will break them, we will move them for you. Well, your point is exactly what happened in Richmond. That Lee mine, the, the great Lee equestrian became one of the greatest works of graffiti in the world before then Governor Northam got on board with that and found there was a law he could use yes. to change public monuments in space, even though he was sued for doing it. But that monument, the people were saying, is coming yes. down, whatever the law is, basically. But in that case, they at least waited for the law. But it was already this work of, of protest art. <laughs> yes, which is what's so powerful to me about Allison's photo of that. I'm just yeah, yeah. like, yeah, it's as easy as breaking a window. It's as easy as getting up on a flagpole like Bree Newsom with some climbing gear. Yes. We, we ask rhetorically, who are we as a nation and how must we reckon? But it's like we reckon through actions and that's what I find so powerful about that photo. Yeah, and I would just like to bring Allison uh, into the conversation again. Um, you know, um, uh, CJ referenced uh, Brie Nielsen and also um, in the film, there's Kahindi Wiley and, and mm -hmm. uh, particularly Gr Dred Scott in terms of his, his uh, community engaged performance. Mm -hmm. um, what role do you see artists, um, you know, your generation of Allison, um, uh, uh, perhaps filling in a gap around shifting the narrative around um, uh, also Kind of stepping in around the issue of, of, of mythology, changing mythology, and also navigating trauma and representation. Right. I think it's it's important to to remember that artists like we're not the historian, we're not the journalists, right? So we can operate in a space of imagination. And so with the archive, and you know, there's it's, there's 
there's always going to be misinformation, right? And how do we find ourselves within that? You, you, you got to have imagination. Um, and so you see that with Kehinde is, you know, um, rumors of war. And, and you see that with uh, Amy Sheldt, where even you see it with a lot of artists. And I just think that just artists should be mindful of how, you know, how memory shows up, right? Memory isn't only just this tangible object, like, yes, this person wrote this book and this happened, right? Because you can have something happen to you, like a certain truth, um, but not, not, it's not recorded, right? But it still holds a, a, a level of value and, and a, tr- a personal truth. Um, and so that's how I, I make my work. And I just think for artists, just be mindful that like, um, you know, uh, just be mindful how memory shows within the body, how it shows in the mind, how in the different forms that it can and pop up and how we can like work through that space. Like, cause we have that um, privilege to do so, to, to imagine we're, we're, our, we're world builders and that's what we do with our work. And it's, and it's, it's also, oh, yeah, I was just gonna say it was, it's key. I mean, the, the, those statues, those monuments, are so beautiful. I mean, there's there's an elegance to them, even as they're holding up things which which I feel so ambivalent around, which we, we feel so ambivalent around. Um, so there is. I was speaking with um, a, a dean at Yale, and he was mentioning uh, this 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 uh, conference that was coming up around science, and he said, "Well, we could share our stories during this this week long conference, but." until we get to the next year and do it again at the next conference, you know, we don't, we don't have a way of maintaining the story. And so the, you know, it points to the fact that artists actually are able to um, allow for a continuity of the narrative. Mm-hmm. And, and I was gonna say like, what a time for artists now, right? That like, we're here because Confederate monuments are, are weaponized art. Right, mm-hmm. I, I was just working with a, a group of architects in, in, in t- at Tulane, architecture students, and what I was telling them is Confederate monument issue is a design problem, right? Mm-hmm. This is, art has never been more important and we have never been able to see that a single piece of art can have an effect on actual equality and, and people, people's lives for hundreds of years, right? Mm-hmm. That like the, the daughters, the UDC understood that we can, with a couple hundred thousand dollars, we can create a piece of art that is a lie and that will change the memory of the nation. Have a performance around it, which the film right. illustrates. I hadn't, I, I wasn't aware of that whole, you know, Different ritual. Flags. With their yeah. creepy, yeah. creepy really child flag, with their creepy, creepy child flag rituals. So it's like, <laughs> as we're talking now rhetorically, right, about how do we see ourselves, the folks who are solving it are artists. Right, the like Kahende Wiley is not like, hey, look, it's George Washington Carver again. Right, he is saying no. This is this is an unnamed black man now with dreads, the type of man who you would see be shot. It is him in a powerful position, mm-hmm. right? Uh, like Dred Scott is thinking, hey, how do I show that we always resisted slavery mm-hmm. and the image of you know the the sheer parallels between seeing black people in mock rebellion right in in reenactment of rebellion and then only a couple months later in actual rebellion in 2020 in the streets i find that all really striking and to me the question is you know this goes thomas to your film of through lens darkly it's like what allison is doing and what all of these artists are doing is not making an argument as to why we're people or why racism is bad. It is giving like black and brown people ways to see ourselves in power that we have never had on the landscape. And I think that's really exciting. I want to go to one. I'm hopeful that uh, the memorialization that will come out of this Yale and slavery project, which President Salway already announced, he already signaled there is going to be memorialization. Now what it's going to be is to be determined, but Mm -hmm. I hope, it inspires all kinds of creativity, mm-hmm. not just a single memorial, but all kinds of creativity. Um, for I wanna, example, I, 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 mean, I, I, I want to go to the question. Come, come back. Well, come back to that, uh, David. Uh-huh. Um, there are a f- bunch of people. I, I'm, I'm, I'm being told that I need to go to questions now. Um, so, anonymous person wrote, 
um, referring to the uh, weekend of violence in Charlottesville should have been enough to change things across Virginia. It wasn't. Ask the group, do they share this sentiment and what will change? So that's one question. I'm going to ask another, que another question as well. An another anonymous person writes, for me, the most frustrating aspect is that change is not linear. Acknowledge this frustration and ask, what are the uses of anger and frustration? So I have those two questions. Uh, I I'll, I'll hit that quick of, we have this idea, right? We're like, wow, the violence in Charlottesville should have been enough, right? Or the violence, the violence in Emmanuel AME Church should have been enough, right? We have this belief in our better angels. But if you read anything David Blight has written, it's like, it's like the, 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 the Louisiana outrages should have been enough. Lynching should have been enough, right? That, 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 that the taking apart of reconstruction where we saw black bodies in the streets every day should have been enough. And I think that it just really brings home this issue of this is an issue about what white people are able to face in this country about their own past. Mm. Right. That that like like what are white people in this country able to admit about the links between what has happened and is still happening now? And I think that there is a you know, this is what Baldwin talks about a lot as well. Right. That 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 you saw immediately the stories spinning after Charlottesville being like, OK, uh, you know, this is an exception. This is not who we are. Right. You, you, you saw a, a, a belief in these are just extremists, not that these are the sons of baby boomers who never taught those kids that race is real. Right. Like these are the sons of baby boomers who, t who raised their kids to believe, oh, we're all equal now and let's not talk about race. So they had no tools for understanding why black people continue to talk about race and it being a problem. So I think that there is this 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 question about what will change. I think it requires us to be honest about whiteness and white supremacy as it is happening. And there are conservative stories that people tell, but even liberals, we tell a story that this is not who we are. We are better than this. And, and we are not able to see the links of how much, very much it is who we are, is who we have been. And we continually choose to make sort of excuses around it. I want to go to another question. Thank you, CJ. Natalie wrote, there are always too many dog whistles to bring change right now. There are always too many dog whistles to bring change right now. What do you make of these dog whistles and how do we hear dominant narratives clearly? And that's for any, anyone on the, on, the, on the panel. Well, there have always been dog whistles, lots of them. Uh, politics is about fear whether we like it or not. Politics is about wedge issues. It is about getting your people to the polls and scaring them there if you can, because the other side is doing that. I mean, let's be real now. Politics is a, is a war by other means. It really, if, if, if we're not learning that in this particular era, we'll never learn it. Uh, so, you know, yeah. The problem is that we do have one side in our political culture that is really good at dog whistles. I mean, they're brilliant at it. Uh, and, and, and big lies, little lies, whatever you want to call them, they're really good at it. But back to the should question, because I think it really is important what CJ said. Should is a deeply human impulse. It's part of our human condition. It, that shouldn't have happened. That should be but it's not how history happens. History comes out of conditions in other times and forces and these, these terrible things called human beings. Uh, try to, I would, my advice is try to carve, we can't do it, but try to carve the word should out of how we understand history. We'll and maybe thinking. with some suggestions in terms of uh, re we're, we're, uh, reading materials. <laughs> is, is, are there posts, are there posts that, that happen uh, that are on the Yale and slavery uh, website that people can go to and, and have this uh, another deeper level of understanding of history, you know, without necessarily being a, a, a Yale, a Yale uh, enrolled at Yale? Well, <laughs> I don't know if our website will do that, but back to the artist question, and Allison should weigh in on this. You know, sometimes it is the artists who are left to tell us, mm -hmm. you know, the meaning of almost anything. 
uh, whether that's the poets or the novelist or the or the or the composers and so on. I mean, this is why we have art, because it, it takes us for who we are. It takes us as these creatures of emotion. I mean, we'd like to think we're all rational and we can be convinced that racism is evil and it's terrible and it does this and it does that. But, you know, you're lucky if you are an artist, I would say, because you can process that anger. Back to the question about anger. Artists have a way of processing anger. Whereas the average person who doesn't do art, they got to find some place else to put the anger and that's the danger of it. Um, yeah, I'd like to go to go to Allison yeah. uh, because if you want to respond to that, but I also have a question about art as well. Um, no, I just wanted to say that, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I, I, I think what often happens is that when artists make the work that the general public often assumes that it's, it's the, the labor gets put on us to need to explain everything. And it's like, this is like weird, like, needs to be a needs, needs to be a balance and understanding of like we're making work because we're responding to something right but then sometimes the public can kind of get a misconstrued of like well like yes give me that dissertation or yes give me that you know that book or whatever but like just knowing that like the, the prompt right is for the public to do the work right for you to do the research right we're responding we're making the, the work we're making the imagery we're responding but the labor is on you to do the rest you know, um, you have to do the work. Like it's not all just CJ's work. It's not all just Thomas Alice, uh, Thomas Alan Harris's work. It's not all of David David's wife's work. Like it's like the onus is on you too. So um, let it be a way of a guide, a, a, a guide in. But it's up to you to do the work. I I also want to say a comment about doing the work. It's like Thomas's work, my work, um, Allison's work, like they're so focused on how do we see ourselves, right? And Thomas, in your film, you have a quote from Douglas that's like, freedom is inextricably tied up with the power to create one's own self image, right? So, so my question is not about, ooh, what do we do about these dog whistles? And like, how do, we, how do we contend with the latest bit of propaganda? But what, like literally, what are we doing today from positions of power to make sure that black, brown, indigenous, queer folks can see themselves reflected in the world and in history, right? So like for, as Yale tackles its questions, right? About, about how, how integral slavery was and the different parts of reunification that were clearly white supremacist anchored in Yale, like what will Yale do about that debt? Right, like, like, is Yale adopting a, a system like Georgetown has of of scholarships, or 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 what? You know, like, I, I keep going back to that broken window uh, of like that's action, right? And we're having a conversation because of an action. And then as we're talking about like, ah, oh, man, Tucker Carlson and all this critical race theory, it's like, what will we do to support a teacher to make sure that they do not get fired for teaching that Frederick Douglass existed? You know, like this <laughs> film, we are working with students right now we have been within classes with this film that if a parent reports that i was there teaching the film that teacher could get fired and the school could be fined up to five million dollars of per pupil funding right so what are what are we doing uh in order to push back on those school board candidates who have made that law in 10 states right, who are running on that? What are we doing to push back against those governors and those state legislatures who have passed that? This has happened in 20, this, these bills have come through in 24 states. So I, so I do think it is, I, I would push us towards that question of the broken window. What is the action we are doing to make sure that folks can see themselves? And literally it is not illegal to, to tell black kids about their own history. I think that's a really important question. Um, and um, I mean, that's a, that, that is the, the question, you know, right now in terms of the stakes that the film lays out for, you know, for us, you know, in terms of it's coming out, of, out at a point in which you have um, this, you know, CRT being weaponized like everything else is being weaponized. And so this actually gets to uh, another kind of, um, uh, 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 a question, how can artist building telling stories be used in healing 
from the impact of generational trauma from slavery and post-slavery marginalization. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my family pictures uh, shooting in Southwest Florida, you know, uh, a, a gentleman came, he was in his 70s or 80s, and he came with images of Confederate, uh, Confederate images. We had people coming from all different walks of life. And he says, you know, he comes to our team, which is a multiracial team. And he says, well, I have this image, but I'm not sure if it's okay for me to share you know, this image, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, this morning, you know, I had someone called me up uh, around the monuments question. It happened to be an Italian uh, American who said, well, I feel really torn about this because I feel like um, I, you know, Christopher Columbus thinking about the, you know, the way in which the film points us north, Christopher Columbus is, is, is synonymous with Italian pride. You know, and in a way that 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 uh, 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 Jefferson Davis is, or you know, or Lee is, in terms of southern, southern the southern white narrative, and he's so, their Robert E. Lee. Yeah. So, so how? And, 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 I mean, it's not it's not disconnected. From right, slavery. but it is. It's, yeah, exactly. It's not disconnected from slavery. You know, in a kind of more global perspective, um, and so um, you know, how do we allow for people to? Uh, kind of create new narratives mm -hmm. where they feel like they are part of the creation, uh, mm -hmm. inclusive of the black and brown folks, you know, that you, that you, you that whose diversity you, you know, shared in the film, you know, in terms of the woman carrying the Confederate flag, <laughs> you know, um, so thinking about that, I, I just want to put that out to, to Allison, to, yeah. to CJ. Um, I just want to make a note that, you know, just be mindful that, you know, the camera itself was never in mind for black and brown people. The archive was never designed for us in mind either. And so when I think of cultural, cultural institutions or academic institutions, I think ultimately that's not where we want to be. I, so I'm working on a project here in New Haven, work with black families and like archives and building workshops to like directly work with the people to be like, pull your negatives out of your garage get it out of that shoebox, okay? Let's properly preserve these things because we know what happens when our stories fall into the wrong hands. And once things get acquired in these institutions, you no longer have a say in how that piece of work operates. You know, you can't go back and add new things. You can't take things out. You have no longer any control. You have no, no control. So what can we do on an individual basis? And so that's what I'm trying to work on now is like, meeting up with people, sitting down with families, recording and um, helping them work through their photographs and, and, and making new ones in the same time. I think, you know, at some point I would like to make a book about it, but I thought, oh, maybe I just, you know, you know, put it in like at a Yale library or something like that. But like, no, like we need to maybe think about our local libraries, our local black libraries, you know, where everyone can truly have access. Cause the way I had to get access to that glass window as a student, as an alumni, I just think about what does it say about the actual people who live here, uh, their access to that, you know, and those barriers. So um, I think you, you have to be work directly with the people. I used to have a background in journalism and, and, and recording and used to have these things called like man on the street interviews, right? And you have to be like, tell me a story, like what happened, you know? Um, I just worry about the claws of institutions looking to absorb. <laughs> black and brown experiences that they they do not operate without us so i think we need to be clear about who's really in power here and um how we can take more take our power back yeah. well, it also brings <laughs> up the whole idea of social media and putting one's images up and um and the you know the uh how, how one maintains ownership and also the narrative the control of the narrative david did you want to talk about this tension of the archive well, just real um, quickly uh you know, uh, Allison, I love your point. And, and we need an army of people out there trying to collect from ordinary people. They're, they're, they're boxes of family photos, they're boxes of whatever, letters, diaries, and so on, so on, so on. But I, uh, but, but Allison's also saying that she's, she's being pointed in terms of who is yes. collecting these stories and yes. for, what, for what purpose. I, and I, that's a, it's a project I've also been involved in, you know, in terms of activating family archives for the last 12, at least 12 years. And the idea of well, who, who is doing it, what yes. questions are being asked and where are, where the, where are the repositories for this and, mm -hmm. and what, what is, what is, what's happening beyond that? How are we re reimagining the archive? How are we reimagining these archival spaces, right? Well, no, I understand. And all I wanted to say was, don't give up on 
everything from the Smithsonian to the Yale libraries and everything in between because curatorial work these days in libraries is changing. You, you'll find, I think, uh, a lot of curators around the Yale libraries who are very, very eager to find this kind. It isn't just the James Weldon Johnson collection anymore of all the great black writers and artists. Mm -hmm. They're very interested in collecting these kinds of things, yet they are still living with the image of being Yale and its elitist uh, um, dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to say, we've got to affect the nature of the archives in the great archives, as well as trying to imagine creating other little small ones. Of course. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, that takes resources. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's use the resources that do exist, mm -hmm. you know. Thank you, David. Point, very, very good point. Uh, CJ, um, I think we are getting down to the last bit. We actually need to, I just got a text. We need to start wrapping up. <laughs> I want to, um, give you the last uh, last word uh, you know I, when we when I had was in a conversation with Ken Burns um, about a year and a half ago at, at the Schwartzman and art of the storytelling and the time of disinformation you know, he said that we have two pandemics we have the you know COVID and we have this disinformation and um, and so you know where from your your vantage point in terms of taking this film out, and uh, where you, what kinds of work you hope it will do, continue to do. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think about Christy Coleman's quote at the end of the film where she just says, the vestiges are still here, right? And I think that is what all of our work in this room is, is around, it is around how do, we, how do we make it how do we force America to have an honest conversation about the vestiges that still remain mm -hmm. and about what we owe because we've had a hand in keeping those vestiges up? So I just wanna go back to this because I think it makes it concrete. I am trying to teach this film in as many schools as possible. Uh, I just recently left The Daily Show so that I can spend all of my time teaching this film in schools and uh, trying to bake a new project about critical race theory. So that is to say, if you know teachers who would rock with this film, get with us. I'm easy to find on social media. And then the film is neutralgroundfilm.com or neutralgroundfilm.com backslash teachers. But it's easy to find. Just Google it. We're streaming free all month on PBS. So it's very easy to get this to your friends and family who want to see it. It's just everyone in America can literally see it for free until December. But I, but I, I want to go back to that idea that, it, but if I go into a school, and teach this in, in Tennessee, for example, that black teachers can and are getting fired for teaching black children the truth about history, right? This, this, is, this is happening in Jacksonville, this is happening in Texas, this is happening in, 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 in Nashville, that, that you, we, we have the names of folks who have been fired for this issue. And imagining that these schools can be fined up to $5 million of per pupil funding. What does that look like across a nation, right? If private schools are fine and public schools with mostly black and brown kids are continually getting their resources sucked for teaching those kids their own history. So I end on that example because I think it should haunt us, right? This is not a rhetorical thing about, ah, oh, wow, really, what should we do about the plaque on this arch? Or what should we do about the name of this uh, resident, this college residence, or, 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 you know, wow, how do we ask these questions in a more open-ended way? Like, it is not that the, the, the lost cause will resurge, it is that it is here, and it is that it has baked itself into law. And so if you are in a position like, like Yale, what are you doing to make, to protect your, your own professor's ability to say the truth? And what are you doing in New Haven to back those teachers to make sure that those teachers can tell the truth too. And that, and that this is our focus nationally. This is, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about, we are, we are reliving reconstruction in this very moment of white supremacists being able to make it to office and to literally change the nature of what is happening in public schools. I care more about that than I care about monuments in this moment, because that is like a living form of the uh, amnesia that is at the center of a monument. What are we doing so that kids can learn the truth about this country's history? Yeah, and I, a, I just want to a teacher's bill of rights more than what Kevin McCarthy just called a parent's bill of rights. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. I also wanted just to um, to ask you about organizations like working with organizations like Change uh, uh, org, or and um, uh, 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 popular culture figures such as um, you know singers and um, you know who might be willing to sponsor a kind of a concert or do outdoor screenings. You know, in the spaces of monuments. You know, yes. what, what what would be like? What kinds of support would you need to do that? Yeah, I mean, first, I think it's less about supporting me and more about like all of you know folks who are doing that work, right? So if this film makes you feel good, you should be supporting Take Em Down NOLA. You can Google that very easily. And on Venmo, they are Ted NOLA, like Take Em Down, Ted NOLA on Venmo. How much, how, how much of a good feeling do you have? And monetarily, how much is that worth? Go pay Take Em Down NOLA, right? Go make sure that you are supporting Allison Minto's work or the or even or even better if Allison is like, yo, here are, here are some young black photographers who are or who are working with students, right? That that we we all know folks in our community that we can that we can support. And those folks are pretty easy to find. And we also just like breaking the glass, like, why didn't that occur to folks before? Just like breaking the glass is so easy, right? So if Yale is having this question, like. If Yale is asking how many, how much, how deeply was the investment in slavery? Like, what is the counterbalancing investment in getting more black and brown professors and students at Yale? Right? Like, what num, what percentage of the incoming student body would offset some of that history? Is it thirty percent black students? Is it fifty? Is it set? Is it is it sixty? Right? So I think that. The, the sooner we can move out of rhetorical questions about how much we reckon, and then we move into like, literally I can do something today that, that, that opens up freedom for oppressed people. Like we know who to pay, we know like the decisions to make it, and we kind of hide in rhetoric sometimes, I think. Thank you so much, uh, CJ. And I wanna thank um, our fellow panelists, uh, Allison Minto, Minto and David Blight um, for this um, uh, great uh, screening and conversation. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Jennifer Newman at the Schwartzman Center and Maurice Harris at the Schwartzman Center, as well as Jason Webster, who is managing the technology for this event. And uh, my teaching fellow, Josie Roland Hudson, who helped coordinate the event. This program is part of the continuing film series associated with Family Narratives Cultural Shifts course. Next week, we will screen a, uh, the final film of the series by Maxine Trump, To Kid or Not to Kid, around uh, women who decide not to have children. Um, you'll be able to find this information list listed later on the Yale Arts calendar. We'd also like to thank again our sponsors who generously, generously supported the series, African American Studies, Film and Media Studies, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Center for the Study of Race and Ingenuity, uh, Transmedia and Migration, the Pointner Fellowship, the School of Art, the Yale, Films Archive, the Yale College Arts, and the Schwartzman Center. And with that, I will turn it now back over to Jennifer, Jennifer Newman. And you yes, <laughs> the words of 2021. Hi, thank you guys so much, everyone, for coming tonight. Thank you, Professor Thomas Allen Harris, for this wonderful conversation, this necessary conversation with CJ Hunt, David Blight, and, and uh, Allison Minto. Um, thank you all for, again for coming. Please check back at schwarzman.yale.edu for any events that we have coming up. So please uh, tune in then at 4 to 5.30. Thank you all and have a great evening. <laughs>